Ladies and gentlemen, our next presentation is called Games as Instruments of Societal Coercion, and it's brought to you by Mr. Richard Hoffmeyer and Ms. Jenny Kuglin. Please welcome them. two months ago, but she quit that job so we can make video games together. Um, and our, our new projects generally uh, forego the kinds of coercive measures we're going to talk about today, but we are nonetheless pretty adept at the dark arts of psychological trickery and manipulation. Yeah, I'm afraid he's right. So as Richard said, I have uh, worked in television and online news media, I don't know, for like 75 years or something. And, and the hardest part of doing news is in convincing people that staying up on current events, you know, it's worthwhile and fulfilling, sure, but, you know, uh, it's also kind of really important for this whole system of mutual dependence that we all have together. So um, before you go convincing people that you have something important to say, you should probably first determine, you know, what those important things are that you want to remark on. Uh, so that's news. We curate important information as a means of furthering our own goals. And uh, hopefully, I believe, they're mostly uh, related to improving the world by fostering empathy and uh, informing the voting public. But, like you said, I recently left old media, uh, something I really love, because I have decided that games are a better way of furthering my goals. Um, they're a better means of facilitating a worthwhile discussion, and uh, so that's why I switched over. So uh, Jenny digs up the facts, and I pour on the sugar, more or less. Uh, so I do the art and, and the music, and generally, I guess, try to uh, deepen the mystery and make it more sensually stimulating. Um, so in, in, in that kind of realm, like in both realms, it's, it's really tempting to employ a bunch of these uh, psychological tricks, cheap psychological tricks, because they're effective shortcuts to um, capturing uh, your victim's attention, uh, retaining their allegiance, and uh, to get their money. And what captures attention, retains allegiance, and generates money more effectively than interactive software. Uh, you should tell them about that one nurse who used to come into your casino all the time. Okay. Um, her name was uh, Diane, and she was a morning shift RN at uh, Missoula's Community Hospital. This is a casino. This isn't a hospital. But, um, and that's where I was born, that hospital. At the hospital, not the casino. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, Nurse Diane, she didn't work in the maternity ward. She worked in oncology. And every single day, uh, she'd come into this casino where I worked. Uh, it's one uh, it's one branch in a chain of these Montana casinos called Lucky Lills, uh, and they're always situated in the back of 24-hour gas stations. And uh, so I, I worked at graveyards when I was a high school student, and uh, I saw this nurse Diane every morning. She'd put 15 bucks into the buckhorn slots. She'd smoke three menthols, and she'd sip this uh, complimentary boxed wine product. And then, uh, you know, uh, on her way out the door to work, she'd pick up a whole carton of cigarettes on her way to work to share with the nursing staff at the oncology ward. A whole carton every day. Um, so we're talking about alcoholism, nicotine addiction, and, and gambling addiction. But the, I guess for me, you know, as a teenager, the, the gambling was always most interesting to me um, because I thought my only hope of manipulating people was through, um, or, you know, not just Diane or, or Maybe the world at large was through these kinds of psychological tricks and these means of coercion. I, I think every artist kind of starts as a con artist, um, and especially in video games, right? I mean, this is the realm of everything's based on metaphors, the suspension of disbelief, role play, 
So I guess what I mean is pinball machines, arcade games, fruity play, online time sucks. Pretty much all commercial video games inherit their, their kind of profit pulling magnetism from slot machines, uh, which became video poker and kino. Um, so we're talking severe blinking lights, bell rings, exaggerated reward feedback, diminished downward sloping payout schedules with um, algorithms so complex that even the software engineers responsible for writing the code are afraid to touch the finished games. Um, and uh, during my two years at Lucky Wheels, uh, I met uh, the video poker and video poker architects, and I poured warm keystone light into their plastic cups while they confessed their shameful, deceptive tricks to me. It was very educational. Um, so I met this guy, his name's Mark Scripps Seth, software engineer, and I thought, ah, yes, I can finally live out my heist fantasy. Um, you know, I'll pull out, pull the Oldsmobile out back, and, and he'll, like, hack the machines and drain them, uh, and, and, and we drive off into the sunset together, but no, Mark, wouldn't touch the machines. Uh, the architect feared his creations because they're so complex and addictive and deceptive. Um, so uh, let's go through a, a couple of uh, Mark's dirty tricks specifically. So first, you get your players drunk if you can. Well, that's a given. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> Mark, Mark used to say, we got that one from religion. <laughs> So, but you don't have that luxury in games, always. I mean, you can kind of assume that some people, anyways. Uh, so typically, video gambling machines give $1 in wins for every $5 they make, but the wins slope off in value the longer each single session lasts. And uh, after a cycle of 10 wins or 50 losing turns, um, the win values kind of spike and slope back. It's called elastic dilation, allegedly. I don't know if they still call it that. It's about 10 years ago. But the software's behavior includes um, slight variations, conditional to the internal clock of the machine, the amount of actual cash inside of each one, the frequency with which players stick money in them. Uh, so for example, machines which are more frequently paid into will pay out more generously. The software guys use the phrase metabolic rate. So the ones that eat more will shit more, but eventually they're going to get fat, right? And Lucky Lil is a pretty fat lady, right? She's a cartoon. Uh, another interesting form of casual deceit um, is how one audio recording of quarters uh, spilling into a metal tray plays when any amount of money is won by the player. So say you're betting $1 per spin and one spin wins 15 cents back, you hear the same like, delicious, ecstatic noise of raining money, um, no, no matter what the amount is. So um, even if, you know, it's kind of deceptive. Um, I, I, so I did, I did ask Les, uh, or I'm sorry, Mark, uh, where these recordings came from. And he told me that how they just recorded them in their, in their office, in a code cave, with the microphones that came with their desktops. And um, so, I, of course, I had to know uh, how much money is actually playing in, in this one sound that I, I, like as a casino attendant, I heard this noise constantly all the time. I still hear it when I fall asleep at night. Um, and it's about 15 bucks and quarters but also some paper clips and a wood-handled pocket knife dropped into it. Um, so in my old clip-on bow tie days, uh, the machines used receipt printers and didn't actually spit out quarters. Uh, but it's easy to imagine how, before I began my career in hospitality, these same machines would drop quarters into metal trays while playing the sound of money dropping into trays. At this, it's very strange. Uh, so I will admit, um, I'm a Montanan, and I've lost uh, a few dollar bills in Montana casinos, though I never went to Lucky Lil's because the employees, they're like kind of creepy, so <laughs> it's a, but, um, besides a perceptive person like me, right, a journalist saw through the blinking lights and coin sounds pretty quickly, so my attention uh, moved to much higher stakes gaming. Um, one of my current favorite games it's a massively multiplayer online game, and it uses a touch screen interface often. Um, it's based on a territorial aggregation, and the first player to collect a majority of the finite points, well, they win the game. So players spend resources on conflicting elements like fundraising and advertising while battling for the attention of the news media. Uh, for example, competitors who choose to focus on travel and recruiting, well, they're said to have a good ground game. And after a series of elimination rounds, essentially playoff games, they gear up for the big dance in the fall. And en route to the national championship, each side they wear symbolic colors and logos. They've got these really cute mascots and fight songs, chants and brass bands and confetti. 
and just miles and miles of bunting, and you know, it's called the United States presidential election. <laughs> and uh, so here's an example of some of those uh, great technological advancements in action. Let's take a look. Oh, you guys remember this in Pennsylvania? Guy took his cell phone into the booth and his campaign was yeah. So, uh, but these types of uh, coercive measures aren't just being employed during the election season. Uh, in Great Britain, games were being used to motivate the unemployed through innovative use of false compliments. So, the government's behavioral insights team, aka the Nudge Unit, created a web test called My Strengths. And the Nudge Unit, well, they're responsible for encouraging and supporting people to make better choices for themselves. So you could take uh, the My Strengths test and answer a series of questions about your behavior. The test then revealed to you insights about your personality. So for example, each one of you, very unique snowflakes in this audience specifically, would be praised for your love of learning, your curiosity, and your originality, no matter how you answered the mandatory questionnaire. Um, and I don't know about you, but originality is really my favorite mass diagnosis. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, so the Nudge Unit costs just over half a million pounds to run. That's $785,000 annually about. Set aside by David Cameron himself because, quote, human behavior can be shifted dramatically by small changes in the way people are presented with information. <laughs> so um, when bloggers inevitably showed that uh, regardless of how the test questions were answered, the test results were reliably identical. A spokesperson replied, here's another quote, we've had extremely positive feedback from both job seekers and their advisors. It is right that we use every tool we have to help job seekers who want to work find a job. So, so there you have it. Positivity is greater than truth. The ends justify the means, and getting those lazy limeys off the lounge chairs is worth the cost of a little white lie. Well, and 785,000. Um, but isn't it a little like, does the stress make me look fat? I mean, some people don't want the truth. They'd rather get a compliment because confidence is the desired result for both parties. You know, it's, it's mutually beneficial. Uh, so let's uh, talk about an example of this dynamic at play in video games. Um, so last October, we attended a really great games festival in LA called Indiecade. Uh, it's amazing, you all should go, the seriously, the best. Um, so on this beautiful uh, 70 degree evening, we all gather to play games outside at night, um, and a game called Ranga, it just, it stole the show. So it was projected on this enormous screen, while hundreds of people in the audience participated. Um, we're all given laser, laser pointers, and we're told to work together in guiding our spaceship against alien enemies and these potential space disasters. So you know, it was really disconcerting at first, watching all these hundreds of lights sort of swarming and flying chaotically across the screen. And you know, how do you know which dot among the swarm is your own? And how can we trust each other to make smart decisions? And, but somehow, we all began working together. Uh, we clicked into place. And the swarm became collectively intelligent. So it was amazing. We steered our dots like perfectly into this circle shape. and guided our ship through exciting, nearly disastrous close calls, and the game's robotic announcer praised our efforts, and we got better and better, we fought the bad guys, dodged asteroids, floated in harmony together, collectively, mutually, and, you know, I wasn't just one among hundreds of individual lights, we were a swarm, like, like a flock of birds in perfect unison, we were better together, collective skill conquers all, we're all one. So, you know, I almost started crying, and uh, I went home thinking about, this is what I'm thinking about changing my career. Like, games can be beautiful and so uniting. It's like true communion. But then they broke my heart. Um, the game's authors have disclosed that the Ranga experience is safely guided by a man behind the curtain. Uh, we, the audience, had, had, we really had suddenly learned how to work together, noisily, sloppily, and clumsily at first, but united nonetheless. Um, so sure, we were, you know, pointing our lasers in harmony, and the game did track our behavior and respond programmatically, but nonetheless, we've been seduced by a false compliment. The game desires, designers, they were manipulating the game live, and they give us easier levels if we weren't doing well. So it assured we'd win, no matter how well or poorly we were actually working together. It's, it's kind of the opposite of the pre-recorded coin sound, right? Like this is something done in real time that's masquerading as a pre-rendered conditionally triggered feedback mechanism. Um, only that, that it's 
it's, it's a real thing pretending to be a game instead of a game pretending to be a real thing. But I, either way, I kind of feel like it's dishonest. I don't know. Yeah, so all of these wonderful, loving feelings that I had that night, they're really kind of taken away from me, and I felt lied to. You know, I really wanted to believe. So we were deprived of the opportunity to learn something about ourselves. The authors concluded that the better, more fulfilling experience for, for us, for me, um, was the authored one they'd imagined already, and not something really authentic and spontaneous. They disallowed for that, and prioritized the audience's happiness ahead of the opportunity to learn something maybe only potentially sour. And, it's not the first time this particular trick has been performed on an awestruck audience. Uh, Lauren and Rachel Carpenter pulled it off in 1991 with colored tape and a modified version of Pong. And today, Michael Hengel's 1492 company performs these like corporate team building activities with this same sort of device. In, in the case of um, 1492's uh, corporate things, they, uh, they, these uh, uh, participants, they hold up paddles, which uh, they're told they uh, navigate an airplane, right? Uh, and of course, despite several amazing close calls and near misses, the, the plane never crashes. The audience cheers. This kind of theater um, is, is worth every penny to companies who want their employees, believing that the group is stronger and smarter than any individual, um, and that together they have a special dignity. Um, it, it, it's, it's kind of appropriate, I suppose, that Engel's company slogan is powered by happiness. Kind of. Anyway, so the, the UK's nudge department wants the unemployed to feel happy too and capable of doing great work, which was largely true, but apparently not worth investigating. I think that's the distinction. Uh, besides, I mean, okay, so lots of people leave lucky wills with pocketfuls of $100 bills, right? Like, I, I made some tip money from people who won, but what Jenny and I, I guess, are we're trying to say is that we feel investigating real truth is more important and a better public service than false comfort or disingenuous coddling. Um, we're saying that mutual understanding is greater than mutual happiness. Ignorance is bliss, sure, but it's also ignorant. And I actually believe that you know, we can work together to make things better, that the group can be stronger than the individual, that we are connected in a really meaningful way. And I also think that all those unemployed folks who look for work after taking that test, they did have special skills and a unique place in this world. And I think Diane's money would have been better spent on maybe, I don't know, an Xbox or Wii or games that interacted with her in an honest and forthcoming way and maybe even revealed new worlds to her in the process. So, so uh, yeah, people generally are, are smart collectively. And when, when games employ these shortcuts and control their players, it, uh, it disallows for true experimentation and, and meaningful interactivity. So um, presuming or, or dictating an outcome in order to coerce players into a specific reaction is a service to both their victims, but I think also a kind of all interactive software everywhere. It makes people less trusting of it. Yeah, and then the worst part for me is that I believe the people who worked on some of these games that we talked about, well, except maybe that Mark guy at the casino, but I think they all have really, really great intentions. And the problem with lying or giving these false compliments is that when people find out, and let's be honest, like nowadays we always do, they'll feel really cheated and let down. So you'll have done more harm to your cause than if you let your audience come to the conclusion on their own. So the UK's uh, job search, they did see a spike in workforce participation during that the nudge questionnaire right after. Uh, it's since been shut down. Uh, and there's more Lucky Wells branches in operation now than, than ever. And uh, Ringa's audience chose it as their very favorite game to indicate. I voted for it. So cheaters kind of win in the short term, at least authors do, or I, I don't know. But it, it, so I guess what I'm saying is if your goals or, or your clients' goals or um, your corporation's goals are of the short-term variety, um, uh, I have a list of 38 surefire deceptive techniques, which I personally guarantee you'll win your audience's attention, allegiance, and, and ultimately their, their money. But um, so see me after the show if you'd like one for yourself, but ultimately it's more effective to use art, music, and you know, writing an investigation to enrich your player's experience with sensual depth and mystery, and those things are great too. It's tempting to employ a bunch of cheap psychological tricks, and game designers should familiarize themselves with such shortcuts to capturing a victim's attention and allegiance and money, because you have to consciously choose to avoid using them. Right, so if you are making games for change, and that's your objective, just don't give false compliments. Collective intelligence is beautiful, 
All of us are smarter than any of us, and most of us, I really believe this, want to help make the world a better place. So let's trust each other and our players. Disclose your intentions and do this really hard thing, which is forfeit control your audience. Because that's the one thing that only games can do. shy on time, but I think we got about a minute here, so we'll try and be terse if anybody's got a question for us. Yes? So, so what's the difference between the fake tape of the coins dropping and let's say um, the sound of a major gun when you press the trigger? So that's a good one. So the question is, what's the difference between the, the sound of the coins dropping and a, and a video poker machine and the sound of a laser in like a combat game, am I getting that about right? Um, I was hoping to maybe paraphrase that way in a beneficial kind of making you look bad and me look good, but um, it's a fair question, I suppose. Uh, I guess for me, do you have any ideas on this one? I, I suppose for me the, the difference is that um, that's kind of just this, one of those sensual kind of experiential rewards that the player gets and it just kind of deepens the experience. Um, but in the case of the coins dropping, it's more, I think, manipulative. I think it's more deceitful. Um, it's one of those things that's like, um, you know, obscenity or cynicism. It's just, you know, when you see it, I suppose. But I'm, I'm curious, do you, do you think that there's a significant distinction there? Or do you think it's arbitrary? Um, I'm just trying to, just trying to think about your idea of, you know, manipulating people's expectations. Well, I, I, okay, so I guess the difference is like, um, it's, it's the, the purpose, the intent, I suppose, is, is, is a, one of the ways that we can kind of analyze it and make a distinction, right? So um, the intent is to make the player feel as though they're more rewarded financially than they actually are. And so that's, an, that's like a material deception. And in the form of a laser, we're just trying to impress people, I suppose. Make it more like more people. Or past time. Oh, are we past time? Yeah. Well, um, we'll be around. Sorry, we went so long. Be easily identified. I'll, I'll keep wearing this goofy thing and come focus and stuff. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thanks so much.